Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, so I'm a physical oceanographer. I'm going to be talking about uh, something specific to the East Greenland Current. Uh, it's addressing a big problem in oceanography and climate, and I'm focusing on one little uh, piece of it. Um, maybe a little more diverse audience than I'm used to uh, lecturing to, so we can be very informal. If you're not familiar with the region or uh, with some terminology, um, just speak up. Um, okay, so the big problem, why do we care about freshwater fluxes in the East Greenland Current? This is a schematic of the global, uh, all the conveyor belt or thermohaline circulation. It consists of a connected set of currents uh, of global scale. Um, the orange ones here represent warm currents, the blue ones are cold bottom waters, and they transport a lot of heat and fresh water around the planet, they exchange uh, with the atmosphere, so it affects weather, it affects climate. And the region I'm interested in in particular is this up here in the uh, Nordic Seas. So this is the main downwelling branch where warm salty water gets cold and dense and sinks and returns to lower latitudes uh, below the surface. So I'm really interested in this region right here. Um, the reason we care about this is if enough fresh water gets introduced into the surface in the interior regions, um, so out here away from the boundary, um, it can inhibit the release of heat to the atmosphere. So it gets released when the surface water becomes more dense than the waters below the surface, they overturn and uh, a lot of heat is exchanged with the atmosphere. That affects the weather in the atmosphere, it affects the climate in the atmosphere. Um, if enough fresh water is introduced at the surface, you can inhibit that deep convection, cap everything off at the surface, and the surface water just gets really cold, but it's fresh, so it's more buoyant than the saltier, warmer water below, and you shut off the heat exchange with the atmosphere. There's evidence in the paleo data that this has happened numerous times in the past, most recently uh, 10 or 15,000 years ago. So that's why we care about it. Um, I'm going to focus in a little more on the region of interest. This is the Nordic Seas, Greenland, Norway, Iceland. Uh, these red ribbons here are warm, salty waters that come from the subpolar North Atlantic. They're drawn into the Nordic Seas. Some of them go into the Arctic through the Barents Sea and through Fram Strait. What returns out of the Arctic is cold and fresh water along the shelf of the East Greenland Current. In these interior regions, it's very deep. It's several thousand meters deep. Uh, that's where we get deep convection. So the East Greenland current is indicated here, flows along the shelf break. So these colors are bottom depth. This is a couple hundred meters. These are several thousand meters. So there's a sharp change in topography along the edge of the shelf. The current flows along that shelf edge and it forms a dynamical barrier. So the water mass properties here on the shelf are quite different from what you find in the interior. That's indicated here by sea surface salinity. Here's Greenland. You see this ribbon of very low salinity along the shelf. That's right here. And not much of it's getting off in here into the interior. So the questions I have, uh, what controls the flux of that low salinity water from the shelf into the interior? And how might that change in the future if we anticipate a warming climate? So uh, this is a section, let me go back roughly right here along the east coast of Greenland. This is a section of temperature, salinity, and velocity. This is the shelf. This is that steep topography. And then out here is the interior of the basin. Um, the temperature, you can see it's relatively cold at the surface. That's freezing point, minus two. It's about a couple hundred meters deep. There's this blob of uh, relatively warm water. So it's above freezing temperature. This is Atlantic water. It's also very salty. And that was water that I, I showed came in on the east side along Norway, goes cyclonically around the Nordic Seas and comes back to the south. By the time it gets over here, it's subducted underneath this cold and fresh layer. So it's not exchanging heat with the atmosphere. That's why it's still relatively warm. In the interior, um, it's a bit warmer than this. Um, it's a little bit fresher than the Atlantic water, and it's very weakly stratified. So that interior region is where you get this deep convection and mixing every winter. This section was taken in the summer, so you can see there's a little thin layer of warm 
and fresh water at the surface. But come winter, that will get eroded and it will mix down here. Well, if we look at these solid lines, those are the isopycnals. You can see they're relatively flat over the shelf. And then where this water mass transition is at the shelf break, you see they rise. Coincident with that is a southward flowing uh, geostrophic current called the shelf break East Greenland current. This is about uh, 50 centimeters a second. So this is a dynamical barrier, both because of the topography and because of this current, it's kind of uh, keeping this cold and fresh water from getting off into the interior. This basic structure is found all the way from Fram Strait at the exit of the Arctic Ocean down to Denmark Strait. So the region I'm interested in is that Fram Strait to Denmark Strait um, stretch. I don't know if you can read these captions. Uh, these are a couple of schematics of the freshwater budget along this East Greenland current. And um, the main point is we're getting, this is the north, this is the south, so Denmark Strait, Fram Strait. There's about 100 units commonly reported on millisphere drops, or 10 to the third cubic meters per second. Um, 100 or 150 millisphere drops comes out of the Arctic Ocean. Most of that passes uh, south of Denmark Strait. There's a little bit that comes off of Greenland on the order of 10, so a very small compared to what's coming out of the Arctic. And some of it goes into the interior, uh, both as liquid or freshwater and sea ice. Uh, this estimate puts it at like 15. This that estimate puts it at 65. So the main point of this is we're getting a lot of freshwater coming out of the Arctic. Most of it goes through Denmark Strait to the south. And some amount that isn't very well known, somewhere between 15 and 65, goes into the interior in the Greenland and Iceland seas. Um, observations of this are sparse, especially in winter because it's covered with ice. Um, it's a difficult place to sample, so the uncertainties are large. On the downside, as you see later when I go through some of the numerical and theoretical stuff, I don't have a lot of observations to compare with. Uh, freshwater flux, well, in the ice, it's just the integral of the volume of the ice. The salinity of ice is very low. So at a first order, we can just say it's all freshwater. In the liquid form, uh, it's defined as being relative to some reference salinity, S sub zero. So it's the integral of the zonal velocity times this uh, salinity anomaly normalized by the reference salinity. And most of these estimates place the solid freshwater flux as being larger than the liquid freshwater flux. Okay, so I'm gonna start out, I'm doing some idealized uh, numerical modeling studies. Um, I'm gonna use that to motivate some more theoretical scaling analysis to try to understand where and by what mechanism the liquid and solid freshwater get offshore. So uh, the model I'm gonna use is a primitive equation model. So it's hydrostatic in the vertical, uh, Navier-Stokes with some parameterizations of mixing. Um, it's coupled to a viscous plastic dynamic uh, sea ice model. Uh, this is my model domain. It's 1,200 kilometers in north-south extent, 360 in east-west. I say north-south, it's an F-plane, so there really isn't any direction, but just for comparison with the real world, I'm going to be talking about north-south and east-west. Um, this is a shelf. It's 200 meters at the boundary, and it goes down to 300 meters at the shelf break. And then there's a steep drop down to 2,000 meter flat interior. Uh, the grid spacing is one kilometer, and there are 40 levels in the vertical, and the deformation radius is about 10 kilometers. So this should resolve the deformation radius pretty well and instabilities of this boundary current. Um, let's see, this is my topography. Uh, I'll talk in a little more in detail, but the model is forced by an idealized atmospheric fields. So I specify a two meter air temperature, uh, 10 meter winds, downward short and long wave radiation, I calculate outgoing long wave radiation. Um, the albedo changes, whether you have sea ice or open ocean. Um, and then the fluxes of momentum and heat are calculated using bulk formula. So any questions on the model or configuration? Okay. Um, there are these sponge regions here near the Southern and Northern boundary. I'm gonna force the model with a specified inflow condition of velocity, temperature, salinity, and sea ice. 
And I'm using some kind of radiation conditions here on the outflow along with a sponge layer that kind of damps things from reflecting back into the domain. Uh, so what goes out is different than what comes in because I'm having net exchange with the atmosphere. Okay, so these are my model initial conditions. I just mentioned these open boundary conditions in the sponge layers. This is my uh, inflowing condition at the northern boundary. This is temperature, salinity, and velocity. So I have a cold surface layer. I have some relatively warm Atlantic water, and I've got a weakly stratified sort of intermediate uh, interior. So this is representing a deep convection, um, the cold and fresh surface layer, and then the warm and salty Atlantic water. These isopycnals outcrop here. So that gives me a southward flowing uh, baroclinic current about 40 centimeters a second. And then I have a barotropic flow over the shelf. And you may remember, these are the observations that motivated, that's just one hydrographic section. I'll show a little bit later, uh, some climatological mean sections, but they generally follow that pattern. And then at the Northern boundary, I'm specifying sea ice as a function of offshore distance. So that direction and then time. So in the winter, it's about two and a half meters thick over the shelf, and then it tapers off to zero. And then as summer comes, it thins down to about one meter, and then winter it thickens up again. So I have this periodic seasonal cycle of sea ice coming out of the Arctic. All right, now, so for the atmosphere, um, I'm using ERA-5 monthly reanalysis. This is just an example in February. Uh, there's Iceland, Greenland, Norway. Uh, this is short wave radiation, um, long wave radiation, two meter air temperature, and meridional winds. So uh, this is only a weak function of longitude, but it's a strong function of latitude, although the amplitude doesn't vary very much. Same thing for the air temperature, it gets colder as you move to the north. Um, long wave radiation gets smaller as you move to the north. The winds uh, get stronger in the north than in the south. So um, if I look at, say, the a northern value on the shelf right here, this red dot, and a southern value here, I can plot the monthly mean of each of these. So this is the two meter air temperature. Uh, the south is the red line, so it's warmer down here. And the black one is to the north. And they both have a kind of roughly periodic seasonal cycle. Uh, the radiation short wave is actually very similar at the northern and southern latitudes. Long wave um, is a little stronger to the south. And this fell off the page a little bit. Um, but the winds in the south are relatively weak and constant, and the winds at north have very strong seasonal cycle. So I'm going to mimic these patterns like this. These are my analytic functions, uh, air temperature, radiation terms, and the winds. So my winds are uniform uh, in the southern boundary and steady in time. Northern boundary, they have a strong periodic seasonal cycle, and the winds actually decay in a zonal direction. So I have a cyclonic curl over the basin interior. I don't think it's very important for what I'm going to talk about, but it's a little more consistent with the real world. Um, okay, so these are my atmospheric fields. Uh, they're simple sinusoidal functions. They have simple um, meridional decays across the basin. And then I initialize the model with that inflow boundary condition at the section ahead of temperature, salinity, and velocity. And I'm running the model for two and a half years. I'm going to analyze the final two years. So the first six months has some initial condition uh, spin-up effects. So I kind of throw those six months away, and I'm going to look at the last two years. All right, just by way of orientation of what the model fields look like, this is a snapshot in winter of sea surface salinity and sea ice thickness. So it's relatively salty in the interior. It's fresher to the south than to the north. So we can see we've gotten some fresh water off the boundary into the interior. Um, over the shelf, the salinity is about 33. Um, it may not show up very well, but there's this transition here near the shelf break. Uh, it's relatively broad and kind of a weak gradients and weak eddying field. Um, the sea ice is about Two, a little more than two meters here. You can see it decreases to the south. It's about one meter down here, a little more. And you can see we have got some sea ice off into the interior. 
So we have flocked some fresh water into the interior. Uh, we'll try to understand what controls that magnitude in a bit. Now here's the summer, things look a bit different. Um, it's much fresher on the shelf, down to about 28 compared to 33. That's because we melted this sea ice, right? So we went from solid to liquid. That enhances the horizontal gradient in salinity, and salinity dominates density in the equation of state. So there's a strong horizontal density gradient associated with that. We can see that the front is much sharper and there's much more meandering. See these little eddies now on both sides of the front. So now the front goes unstable in the summer, it's shedding eddies in both directions. Um, sea ice now is totally melted by about halfway down the domain. It's thinner here because I have a boundary condition that's pushing less in, but it also melts from interaction with the atmosphere. There's no sea ice down here. So this transition um, from winter to summer turns out to be very important for the dynamics. Uh, and I'll show that in a vertical section. Uh, this is in winter. This is the salinity. Uh, that's, uh, I think, the 32 contour. So remember where that is. We have a relatively broad gradient from the shelf to the interior. The meridional velocity is likewise quite broad. Um, there's the cold temperature at the surface, the warm Atlantic water. And the zonal velocity now is about one centimeter a second onshore. Okay, this is just the Ekman transport. As the ice is moving to the south, the wind's blowing to the south, ice is moving to the south. It gives us onshore Ekman transport. Now, if we look, uh, this is the same thing I just showed you. This is the summer. So now that 32 contour goes all the way out to the shelf break. And we have very fresh water here near the surface. Right on a velocity, now we also see a shelf break jet sitting more concentrated on the outer shelf, whereas here it was quite broad. Temperature field uh, looks pretty similar. We can see a bit of the summer warming. I've cut the domain off. It extends further to the east. And now, because in the summer, the winds are very weak, we don't have much of an Ekman transport at all. These big blobs here are just sort of meanders. They're not Ekman transport, which is concentrated near the surface. So there's a couple of big differences here. Um, we've got stronger velocity shear, got a much stronger horizontal density gradient, and we lose the Ackman layer. Okay, so um, these are some climatological estimates. This is in the winter uh, temperature and salinity. This is taken from all the data we could find, all the hydrographic data, sealed diving data, things like that, averaged along uh, the topographic contours and projected onto a single section. All the data we have isn't terribly much. Uh, these little hatch regions, for example, in the winter have no data at all. So that's just graphing interpolation. Summer is much better, but still in the winter, it's pretty, pretty scarce. Um, the main points here, you can see the Atlantic water. Uh, you can see the cold water at the surface. The front sits about here. In the summer, the front's further offshore. Um, color scale doesn't show it very well, but this is much fresher in the summer and transitions further offshore than it does in the winter. Um, this is similar to the hydrographic change I saw in the numerical model. It's fresher, extends further offshore in the summer. Okay, now I wanna start to look at the freshwater fluxes. So up until now, I talked about the model, the motivation of the model and how the model's forced. Now I'm gonna diagnose some quantities. This is um, averaged over the shelf, so integrated across the shelf, function of latitude and time, uh, the solid freshwater flux and the liquid freshwater flux across the shelf break. Okay, so I'm integrating from north to south, the zonal velocity at the shelf break, um, times the ice thickness and times this um, S minus S naught, so the relative salinity. The first thing to notice, the solid flux, the ice goes offshore in winter. One is the middle of winter, right? So it's really winter and early spring. We're seeing offshore flux on the order of 15 millisfer drops. Um, the liquid freshwater flux in winter is onshore, almost about 10 millisfer drops onshore. So this is interesting. The ice is going offshore. Uh, the freshwater flux is going onshore. Remember, we had looked at the Ekman layer, and that was going onshore. So the ice is not just being advected by the ocean. 
because it's going in the opposite direction. So we can anticipate there's some ice dynamics that are important here. Um, these green contours are time and latitudes when the eddy kinetic energy over the shelf is large. So we can see that the freshwater flux, the liquid freshwater flux, is offshore when the eddies are large and active. Um, but the solid flux is not. In fact, it's a minimum at that time. So this is telling us the liquid freshwater flux happens at a different time and by a different mechanism than the solid freshwater flux. All right, so let's, uh, this is what we just looked at. This is the winter section. Um, and again, this time of year, there's the zonal velocity being onshore. Um, and we don't see the ice following that pattern. So let's look now at the eddy kinetic energy. I mentioned these contours, these green contours are when the eddy kinetic energy is large. Um, it's very weak in the winter when this is onshore and this is offshore. These, these green contours in, in this panel on the right are when two things are met, when the ice cover is less than 80% and when the Richardson number is less than 75, which is an entirely empirical choice. Um, that's when the eddies are large. So when the ice is less than 80%, it's free to move around. The ocean can advect the ice. If it's more densely packed than that, the ice resists moving and it exerts a stress on the ocean and damps the instabilities. The Richardson number, um, the, the ED growth rate or the kind of linear stability growth rate of bare clinic instability in the ocean, gets larger when the Richardson number gets smaller. Uh, Richardson number is the stratification divided by the velocity shear squared, so DVDC squared. And you remember we saw uh, d rho dx, the horizontal gradient in salinity, um, got large in the summer because we melted all that ice. By geostrophic shear, that means DVDZ is larger, and that helps to reduce the Richardson number. So melting the ice increases stratification, but increases the shear by more. So the Richardson number ends up going down. Okay, so we can anticipate then that the freshwater is carried offshore by these eddies. Um, when there's no eddies, it's onshore. That's by the Ekman transport. And we still don't really have a mechanism for the solid flux. So there's a little bit of observational evidence to support this kind of seasonal cycle and eddy kinetic energy. So we're finding it large in late summer, early fall. That's because we melted the ice. So we've got a large vertical shear in the velocity and the ice is either gone or uh, sparse. So it doesn't really put a damping on the instabilities. This is a time series from several different years over the shelf break of eddy kinetic energy uh, down near Denmark Strait. And so this is October, and that's September. And we see a, most of the large amplitudes are here in fall, which is kind of consistent with this. There's this one funny event out here, but that seems to be an outlier. I should look. It's probably from some big wind event or something. I don't know. But this general pattern supports this seasonal cycle in eddy kinetic energy. Okay, so now we'll get to um, a little bit develop some ideas on what might be controlling these fluxes. I'm going to start with the ice flux, and we'll start with uh, momentum equations for the meridional direction and the zonal direction for the ice. Um, so the meridional direction has a wind stress. There's an internal stress term. H is the ice thickness. Uh, P is a, an empirical constant. It's an ice strength. Uh, there's a quadratic drag on the ocean, V sub I is the velocity of the ice, V sub O is the velocity of the ocean. So the drag depends on the velocity differential between the ice and the ocean. Uh, there's a Coriolis term for the ice, and there's a sea surface tilt term, eta is sea surface height. Uh, the zonal one looks very similar, but I have no wind stress term. So I've made a bit of a simplification here for this internal stress term. The internal stress tensor uh, for ice is typically much more complicated, written like this, where these epsilons are strain rate tensors. So it depends on the shear in the ice and the divergence and the convergence in the ice. I'm going to take uh, what's given the name of cavitating fluid, but really just means I'm going to ignore these terms and just keep that one. So that's this term here. And these guys did a study of that. Um, so in a kind of general circulation of the Arctic, this Cavitating fluid stress tensor uh, 
reproduced what they got in a numerical model with the full stress tensor to within 10 or 20 percent in terms of ice thickness and ice motion. So that's the, this is the, the leading order term, I think. It's not complete, but it makes the analysis a lot simpler. So kind of the zeroth order balance. Okay, now we can get another simplification if we assume that the ocean velocity in the meridional direction is geostrophic, so that's a sea surface height tilt, and in the zonal direction has a geostrophic term and an Ekman term. If we put those in, then this sea surface tight tilt terms can be combined with that Coriolis term, and we end up with, this is all the same, when we get over here, the Coriolis terms are now uh, instead of acting on the ice velocity, they act on the velocity differential with the ocean. And the sea surface tilt terms go away. Uh, we still have this Ekman term here hanging around. Well, it's it, these are uh, geostrophic ocean currents. So the use of and visa plus I'm allowing for an Ekman term in the zonal direction. It's going to the south. Uh, that would be this one. Uh, let's see, did I? Yeah. So it's here. It's sea surface tilt balancing meridional. So I'm assuming that in the meridional direction, the ocean velocities and just drive balance surface. Okay, so now we're going to take those equations, non-dimensionalize uh, with these sort of length scales. The velocities are now non-dimensionalized. It's, it's the difference in the velocity I'm taking as a uppercase V. And the Ekman velocity is scaled with that same magnitude. Meridional momentum equation, I've got my wind stress term, uh, the internal stress term, the drag term, and the Coriolis term. And similar for the zonal momentum equation. So these non-dimensional numbers, I won't go through the details, but if you put in typical values, epsilon is order 0.1, so that's the internal stress term. The wind stress uh, is order one. So I've scaled each of these relative to the drag term, right? So the drag term has a coefficient of one, except this one has a link scale in it. Um, okay, so the wind stress is on the same order magnitude as the drag. The Coriolis term is about 0.1 of the drag. And then I have this ratio of length scales. So I'm saying that the zonal length scale is an order of magnitude less than the meridional length scale. And if you remember looking at those figures, things change very slowly in the long flow direction, change quickly across the shelf. So if we put these in, we can see that um, leading order balance in the meridional momentum equation just between wind stress and drag. And the zonal one, this is 0.1, this is 0.1, that's a little smaller than 0.1, but I'm going to keep all three. So this is the meridional momentum equation. Um, in dimensional terms, the difference in the meridional velocity of the ice compared to the ocean, it just scales like this. So the wind stress uh, divided by density and the drag coefficient to the one half power. What this is saying is I'm putting momentum in from the wind onto the ice, and the only way to balance that is by the ice rubbing on the ocean. And that balances the momentum equation. Now, if we change the winds, uh, this system comes to a equilibration very quickly, like on the order of a day, right? So you change the winds, the ice speed changes very quickly. So this balance holds essentially all the time, certainly on seasonal time scales. I can ignore the time rate of change term in the momentum equation. Um, this is, knowing this term is important because, um, it enters my zonal momentum equation here in the Coriolis term, right? So I need that. So the zonal momentum equation, uh, this is the drag term. It's balanced by an internal stress and the Coriolis term. In dimensional terms, U sub I is now the ice velocity. Uh, there are two terms, the stress term. I've pulled everything out here. So the stress term is one. Coriolis term is here. That's the uh, meridional velocity that we just solved for. Um, so if you put in typical values for the Coriolis term, it's much less than one, 0.1 or 0.2, something like that. So it's really the stress. The stress is positive, so it's pushing the ice offshore, 
right? The ice is thick near the coast. It's zero in the interior. So the pressure gradient, the stress term is pushing the ice into the interior. The ice is going to the south. So the Coriolis term is pushing it back on the shelf. These two are fighting with each other. Uh, this scaling suggests that the Coriolis is going to lose and the internal stress pushes the ice offshore. Um, if we want the ice volume flux, it's just this velocity times the ice thickness at the shelf break times the meridional length scale. So this will give me freshwater flux. All right, that's all the scaling. I'm going to go back to the numerical model and I'm going to look at the momentum balance in each of the zonal meridional uh, ice momentum equations. So this is the meridional momentum equation. This is a two years of time. Uh, the blue is the drag term and the red is the wind. And to leading order, they balance. That was the balance that we anticipated. Um, momentum input from the wind is dragging on the ocean. Stress term isn't zero, it's uh, small. And I think it's the shear term. Uh, remember my cavitating fluid model ignored shear. But there is shear in the East Greenland current. So I think that's where this resistance is coming from, uh, the shear term. But to leading order, this is the balance that we assumed in our scaling. The X momentum equation is mostly the balance between sea surface tilt, which is the green line, uh, and the Coriolis term, which is the black line. That was that uh, trick I used to get rid of the sea surface tilt term by putting it into the Coriolis term. It, this is just geostrophy. So the leading order balance is tilt and Coriolis. If I take those away, what's left is uh, the stress term that's balanced by the drag. And then there's a little contribution by the difference between the green and the black, right? So the residual between the green and the black called the ageostrophic part, uh, plus the drag balances the stress. That's exactly what we predicted from the scaling. The main balance was um, the stress term. So what's happening? The stress pushing water off, Coriolis pushing water on, the stress is larger. The only way to balance that is to develop a zonal velocity of the ice up to the point where the drag balances uh, the net force between the Coriolis and the stress. And that adjustment again happens very quickly, just like in the meridional direction. Okay, so those are both consistent with the scaling. Um, you can ignore <laughs> pretty much everything in here, except I just wanna say now I'm gonna run a whole bunch of these numerical model calculations, exactly like the one I talked about, but varying parameters, because the scaling is predicting a parameter dependence. There are unknown coefficients in those scaling. It's not an exact solution to the uh, ice momentum equations, right? I don't know what H is as a function of X, Y, and time. I'm just scaling things. So um, I, want to, I want to predict its dependence on these parameters. So I'm going to vary the wind stress, the internal ice stress, uh, the thickness of the ice coming out of the Arctic Ocean, the bottom drag coefficient, Coriolis parameter, and uh, the, the um, haline contraction coefficient. By varying haline contraction coefficient, I, I can have the exact same hydrography, but I just change the velocity of the current in the ocean. Okay, so now I ran a whole bunch of those. I'm going to show scatter plots like this. Uh, each of these symbols represents one of those calculations in, uh, in that table. The red star is the one that I talked about in some detail in the beginning. That's kind of my canonical central case. Um, and first thing I'm comparing is the average difference in the ice and the ocean velocity as a function of the scaling parameter. And they're pretty linear. Um, it's a bit smaller than the scaling predicts, but that's, I think, because I neglected that stress term. That's slowing things down a little bit. But the linear dependence uh, is predicted pretty well. It's most sensitive to uh, the drag coefficient and the wind. These circles are the wind, the diamonds are the drag coefficient which is what we'd expect because they're what show up in here. There's a little scatter from these other ones because uh, the stress term um, depends on things like how much ice there is and where it is. And, uh, I diagnosed that from the model and that depends on things like the hydrography and the eddy kinetic energy and so on. So there's some higher order effects that give a little bit of scatter around here. Okay, so now offshore flux of solid ice uh, this is diagnosed from the model in millisphere drops. So 
10 or 15. Uh, this is predicted from the theory. This is the U sub i that was the scaling theory. This is the Ekman velocity, which I can get because I know the Murnau velocity. And this uh, C sub i is an unknown scaling coefficient. And again, there's, there's uh, to me, surprisingly good agreement. Uh, there's the red star. Um, it's most sensitive to the ice thickness coming out of Fram Strait, these triangles, and that one as well. That's because it depends on h to the one and a half power. The velocity depends on the ice thickness to the half power, and then the flux depends on the velocity times the ice thickness. So it's most sensitive to how thick things are coming out of the Arctic Ocean. For most of these, it's not very sensitive to the wind, but I'll show where it, it can become important. Okay, um, that's the one I just showed you. Uh, this is the ratio of the Ekman velocity to the ice velocity. And it's typically about 0.2. So the, the Ekman velocity is onshore, but uh, internal stresses are just forcing the ice offshore even faster. Um, this one's an outlier. That's where I have really strong winds. So my meridional velocity is larger, so my Ekman transport's larger. And now it's getting to be on the same order of magnitude as uh, the internal ice stress. So we can anticipate stronger winds, uh, things might behave a little differently. Okay, any questions on the ice stuff? I'm gonna talk a little bit now about the liquid. Okay, good. So now I'm showing, uh, this is diagnosed function of time, the final two years in depth. Uh, this is the mean freshwater flux, um, the eddy freshwater flux, and then this is the total average over the year. So we can see the freshwater flux is negative, meaning it's onshore uh, in the winter. That's the Ekman transport. Remember I showed that before. Uh, it's pretty weak in the summer. The eddy flux is weak in the winter because we don't have any eddies, uh, but it's pretty strong in the summer. So those are these time periods here. That's when the eddy kinetic energy is large. If we integrate those, so now we're showing as a function of depth, um, the mean is onshore near the surface, that's the Ekman transport. The liquid is offshore over depth, uh, that's the eddies, a larger vertical scale in the Ekman layer, and um, the total is offshore at depth and onshore at the surface. I haven't talked about heat much, but um, the eddies also carry um, mid-depth, uh, 50 meters, heat flux offshore. So that's the Atlantic water, kind of uh, at the top of the Atlantic water getting carried offshore in the eddies. Okay, so now let's do a little scaling on the freshwater flux. I think there's two things going on. Um, one is eddies, and the other one is the Ekman transport. So let's look at the eddies first. Uh, they would scale as U prime S prime, should be a bar over that. So the eddy salt flux times a vertical scale uh, times a meridional length scale. So just integrating the eddy freshwater flux offshore. I'm gonna assume that the eddies are uh, scale as geostrophic balance. So to leading order, the eddy velocity is gonna be proportional to the salinity anomaly of the eddy. If I can combine these two, uh, and I get an estimate for the eddy freshwater flux. Depends on the Coriolis parameter, depends on the deformation radius, depends on the eddy kinetic energy. Now the wind one is easier. Um, that's just the Ekman transport. So tau rho naught F times the salinity anomaly times a meridional length scale where S sub S is the surface salinity. So neither of these do I know in absolute terms, right? They're both just scaling estimates. This one, I don't know what that is. Uh, the other one, I don't know what the coefficient is, right? I, I just assume the parameter dependence. So the freshwater flux is gonna be the sum of the eddy term and uh, the wind driven Ekman term, and they each have an unknown coefficient, C1 and C2. So, um, now I'm plotting, again, the diagnosed liquid flux from this series of model calculations with this combination where I've just chosen C1 and C2 to give me the best linear fit. Uh, that's here for all the calculations. I mean, there's a, quite a bit of scatter, but you know, there's, it's getting the right parameter dependence uh, for 
most all the calculations. Um, that's the central one. And, you know, the circles are going in the right direction. Triangles are going in the right direction. Uh, they all hover around zero. So not much liquid freshwater flux. Um, it shows up even more clearly if now I'm plotting the ratio of W over E. So the ratio of these two terms, this one over this one, and the, the diagnosed flux, and they're uh, pretty linear. So as the wind becomes more important, the liquid flux is more and more onshore, this battle between Ekman transport and eddy flux. All right, so um, that's for today. What might happen in the future? Now that we have some parameter dependencies, we can anticipate how things might change if things like the ice coming out of the Arctic change or the winds change, which uh, as best I can determine from looking at climate models, those are the two most likely changes uh, in a warming climate. The winds will probably get stronger and there's gonna be less ice coming out of the Arctic. There'll be more liquid freshwater flux coming out of the Arctic. Um, but for now, let's just look at the wind stress and the ice thickness. I'm looking now at sea ice diagnosed from, from my scaling theory. This is roughly today. So as the winds get stronger to the south, um, less ice gets exported. That's because the Ekman contribution gets larger and larger and pushing the ice back on the shelf. Right? So just kind of holding it on there. As the ice thickness coming out of the Arctic gets thinner, it also uh, exports less ice. That's because the ice flux depends on H to the 1.5 power. So in most likely scenarios, we're gonna see less ice going from the shelf into the interior. Um, the eddies are much more difficult to predict because we have these two counteracting effects. The winds get stronger, uh, the Ekman transport's pushing the fresh water back on shore. But as the ice gets thinner, uh, there's gonna be less ice cover, more bear clinic instability, more fresh water coming out of the Arctic to increase the vertical shear in the geostrophic current and increase the instability and you have more eddy fluxes carrying that fresh water offshore. I don't know which one will win because I don't know how they're going to change. Um, but it, uh, it may stay near zero. Right now, I think coincidentally, it's very nearly zero, which is also what the observation suggests. Okay, so here's my summary. Um, freshwater flux off the East Greenland shelf is potentially important for climate. That's what sort of motivated the whole study. Um, the numerical model I was looking at was very idealized, but I think representative of the East Greenland current, hydrography, velocity, seasonal cycle. And that suggests that the liquid and solid fluxes are carried by very different mechanisms. When I started this, I was anticipating that eddy fluxes were gonna kind of do everything. Eddies would flux fresh water off and eddies would carry ice off. Um, but the, I didn't find that. And I think the reason is that you only have eddies when you don't have much ice because the ice kills the eddies. Um, the liquid flux occurs in late summer by these eddy fluxes. That's because of both reduced ice cover and reduced uh, Richardson number. The ice flux occurs in winter because these internal ice stresses uh, beat out the Coriolis parameter. And climate change is likely to uh, decrease ice export. And we don't know about liquid. So this, this study had uh, obviously a lot of idealizations. Uh, the model itself, um, I've assumed that the topography is uniform in meridional direction. Uh, that's not true. There are capes, there are uh, canyons penetrating up the shelf. Um, I've assumed the winds are parallel to the coast and, and spatially uniform. Um, I think probably the biggest simplification or potentially most important thing I've neglected are winds that are not parallel uh, to the boundary, to the shelf break. Right? The atmosphere has got a bottom Ekman layer. That's going to steer the winds a bit from the upper atmosphere winds. So that may drive ice on or offshore. Um, the winds also don't navigate the capes of the east coast of Greenland terribly well. So you get regions where you have kind of wind shadows and, and wind accelerations because of the orography of Greenland. I've ignored all of that. Um, and of course, the scaling theory was quite idealized as well. So this, I think, is a starting point. Near as I can tell, I haven't come across any um, theoretical ideas for what controls the flux of fresh waters off the shelf. So I think this is uh, a place to start. So thanks for your time, and I'll take some questions. <laughs>